Friends, let us call one another to the worship of the living God. In the goodness of God, we are traveling home. In the justice of Jesus, we are traveling home. In the song of the Spirit, we are traveling home. In the worship of the living God, God makes home with us. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. Let us come to the Lord who is full of compassion and acknowledge our transgressions and penitence and faith in this season of Lent. Let us pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have refused to hear the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, let us 
pray in bold confidence and remember our blessed assurance in the forgiveness of Christ Jesus. Oh, for the wonderful love he has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon, pardon for you and for me. Come home, you who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Welcome to worship. Welcome to the Kirk. Welcome home. It is so good to worship with you this morning. And to all of you who are worshiping with us on live stream, welcome, welcome, welcome. And to all of you who are at Kirk West, also welcome. We are a family and a congregation that comes together to celebrate on Lord's Day how good God is to us. I'd like to also let you know that we have Connect Station. If you're visiting with us, please visit our Connect Station, which is in the cloister, the hallway of, what do you, what do you call them, Pastor Edwin? Hallway the hallway of windows. And so please go and pick up your free gift and learn a little bit more about our church. Also, speaking of visitors, we have new member class this Sunday and next Sunday at 1130 in the upper room. So if you're interested in becoming a member, please join us. Even if you, if you just want to check it out and see what it's about and learn a little bit more about our Presbyterian denomination as well as our church, it's a great time to come and join us at 1130 in upper room. Also, I'd like to let you know that um, as of today, as you look around, you see a lot of people without masks. Nine o'clock service used to be a mask mandated worship service, but with the downward trend in COVID cases, thank, thank, thank the Lord, and all of the uh, school districts also lifting the, the mask mandate, we have also lifted that mandate during nine o'clock service and all Kirk events as well as Sunday schools. And so I want to let you know that if you are comfortable wearing a mask, please by, by all means do so, but it is not mandated anymore at nine o'clock service nor in at Sunday school, any of the Sunday school classes. Also, if you can, please uh, pick up the uh, pew pads that's found in the inside aisles of your pews and sign them and pass them down so that we know who we are worshiping with today. Today we begin our Lenten Sermon Series, In Word Journey Home. Our six-week Lenten Sermon Series will truly take us home as we learn how spiritual disciplines and practices draw us closer to the heart of God and to ourselves. Based on Richard J. Foster's classic book, Celebration of Discipline, we'll be journeying to the cross with Jesus and arrive at the empty tomb to be at home in new life and resurrection. For each Sunday morning worship and Wednesday midday, uh, Wednesday midday reflection, meditation, we'll take a look at each of the 12 spiritual disciplines for six weeks. Celebration of Discipline will be on sale um, at actually the Connect Station, at Connect Station today, as well as next week, Sunday as well. So, and it's also available on Amazon and other bookstores, and a free Kindle version is available as well. So please join us in reading the book as we preach on it dur during our six weeks of Lenten series, sermon series, Inward Journey Home. 
Today at 10 o'clock, right after this service, in upper room, we have Dr. Meredith Height Estevis, who will be teaching a class on the Stations of the Cross. So she'll be doing an introduction to the Stations of the Cross. And so please join us. This will be our Lenten art series. And every Sunday for six weeks, or for five weeks at least, we'll have a class that is related to Stations of the Cross, our creativity, and the arts. And so please join us. Also, as I mentioned before, we have midday Lenten service um, on Wednesday. So every Wednesday throughout Lent, we'll be meeting here in Sanctuary for a brief meditation. So if you can join us during your lunch hour, please come and do so. It will be a wonderful time of fellowshipping and worshiping together. Please look at your bulletin insert for a very special musical event that is coming up, Finding Home, A Lenten Musical Journey. Um, this will be on March 13th with a very special uh, musician, Alvin Waddles. And so it's at 3 o'clock, so please read all about it and come and join us next Sunday. Also, today is the first youth worship night in the oasis and so if you are interested in if you just want to come and see if even if you're not in high school or mid, mid, uh, middle school you want to come and join us that would be really great as well all families are invited um, and so attend the service from 7 to 7 30 followed by dinner in high school youth group we have red wings games that's coming up it's you're invited to come and join us for Red Wings game on Thursday, the March 10th at 7 p.m. at Little Caesars Arena. It's a great way to build fellowship, get to know each other better, and enjoy each other's company. And you can purchase your tickets on the Kirk website under events. We also have X and Pontiac Showcase on March 16th, which is also found as your bulletin insert, so please take a look at this and know that you are welcome to come on Wednesday at 5.30, uh, March 16th. I don't think I've missed anything. Did I miss anything? <laughs> that's a lot and lots of announcements, and that's because we are a growing church and we're an active church, and there's a lot going on throughout Lent. And so please join us for all of the events and worship services as much as you can. We'd love to see you there. Those are the announcements. Let us continue to worship our God.
Amen. I welcome all the children to come to the front for a word with children. And if you notice, I have a swollen eye. It's because Eli is a strong puncher. So if you happen to sit next to him, be careful. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Isn't it beautiful outside today? It's a little windy. It's a little windy. And a little, little chilly, you think? I thought it was kind of warm. Okay. A little chilly and a little warm. little chilly and a little warm. Yeah, those two can coexist, I guess, right? <laughs> With the wind situation. Well, hey, this morning, I want to talk to you about caves. Have any of you ever been inside a cave? Where? Which cave? The, the what? At a, at a park trail? Okay, great. What about you? In a museum? You got to go in a cave? What about you? It was also in a museum? It was a mine. Oh, it was a mine museum. Okay. That's pretty neat. Yeah, how about you? Oh, it was like an above ground cave. Yeah. There are above ground and below ground. And do you know what it's called to, to explore a cave? Do you know what that's called? It's kind of a fun word. Uh, spelunking. Can you all say spelunking? Spelunking. Anybody been spelunking? <laughs> yes. Right? Well, there's, there's all sorts of levels of spelunking. But I want to share with you inside a cave. I'm going to show you a couple pictures. Bless you, by the way. Um, I want to show you a couple pictures of cave wall, I, they're called paintings. Um, just to give you a heads up, it's kind of controversial to call them paintings because that assumes they were art. Um, so maybe this is like proto paintings, proto art, but they look a lot like paintings that we know. And um, this is, what do you think this looks like? Like an ox or a bison, right? Okay, um, this is actually uh, in the cave of Altamira. Altamira is a place in Spain. And this one's about, I think it's 17,000 years old. Just about there, 17,000, give or take, okay? Um, and then here's another one. Let's see if you can tell which this one is. Let's see, let's pick this one. This is a fun one. Here, I'll make it as big as I can. What do you see? A lot of handprints. Yeah. Well, and, and actually, there are a lot of um, uh, theories about this. This one's a cave in Argentina, and this one is uh, this one's like ten thousand years old, so give or take. And um, and actually, what they believe was happening is people were going inside the cave because of the shape of the imprint that they were they were actually not printing like we would on a piece of paper, but actually going up with the bottom of their hand here, the bottom of the palm of their hand. And so they were praying. So they were prayer prints. That's one of the theories. Uh, They were going in there to pray. Here, I'm gonna show you maybe one or two more. Let's see. Um, Let's do, ooh, let's do this one. Yeah. Okay. What do you see there? Two bulls, maybe, right? Yes, this is known as the Cave of the Bulls. Uh, and it's actually in France, Lascaux, France. And this one's about, it's one of the older ones. It's about 36,000 years old. Um, and there, there are a lot of things it's depicting. Obviously, the most eye-catching are the bulls. And then I'll show you one last one. This one's one of the newer ones. What can you see? Painting on a wall. Jesus. Maybe something like Jesus, someone praying. Where are their hands? And are they clasped together like this? No, no they're, they're raised, right? They're raised up to the sky. This one's about, um, this one's fourth century. So it's, it's you know, 1700 years old. Um, and this one actually depicts Christians in the catacombs, which were sort of like these underground caverns. 
Um, well, in all of these, I want to tell you that today, Pastor Kelsey is going to be talking about a prophet named Elijah who goes to a cave. And this cave uh, and this mountain were actually pretty special uh, because mountains and caves have often, as you see here in these, uh, in these cave depictions, for thousands and thousands of years, they're looked at as special places, kind of sacred spaces where you don't get so distracted by everything around you. You're in a dark and quiet place and you can connect with something beyond yourself with the divine as they would have understood it. They would have connected with God. And here the Christians are raising their hands, which is actually really incredible because when you raise your hands like this, there's a sense that not only are you connecting and receiving, but there's a confidence. You're not afraid, right? Their heads, uh, though it's okay to bow your heads, but their heads aren't bowed in fear and they're not clasped like this. They're actually raised up. And so um, I pray that you, like the caves and the mountains, those special places where you find a place to be quiet and to pray and to connect with God, I hope you find a place like that. Maybe it's outside. Maybe it's in your room. Maybe it's another special room in your house. Maybe your parents can help you find a place this week, a special place where you can pray and see the beauty of God and connect. Sound good? Sound like a plan? Can you report to me when you see me in the halls? Can you tell me, hey, by the way, my parents showed me a spot. Okay, that's your homework assignment. Okay, okay, great. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody. You can go to Sunday school. The Gospel reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 35 to 39. Listen now for the word of the Lord. In the morning, while it was still very dark, Jesus got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The word of the Lord. Good morning. Over the past six weeks, we have closely studied the lives of biblical characters to gain wisdom about our outward journeys during the time of transition in the world, in our church, and focusing on this unsteady world. And so as we seek a deeper connection this Lent, we turn inwards, asking God how to cultivate within ourselves practices of being authentic, and having personal encounters with the living God. So today we explore a time in Elijah's life that will hopefully teach us about the spiritual practice of meditation. So this story is found in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 7 to 13. Listen now for a word from God. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. 
Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and he spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and he went and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, in your goodness, grant us peace. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'd like to retell a story that you may have heard before. This is from the 2006 film, The Pursuit of Happiness. And a young son tells this story to his dad. He says, a shipwrecked man prays to God to save him. A boat approaches, but the man tells it to go away because God will save him, he says. And so the boat leaves. A second boat arrives and the man sends it away, saying, God will save me. And so the man dies of exposure. And when he gets to heaven, he complains to God for not saving him when he prayed. God tells the man, I sent you two boats to save you. <laughs> You sent them away. On the surface, this story doesn't seem like it fits the practice of meditation. The man is in a crisis situation, and although he's praying, we don't know what posture his body takes, if he's quieting the mind. We don't know what sort of meditation practices at all if this man is taking. And so I tell this story because it illustrates the truth that sometimes God speaks to us in ways that we don't expect. In our scripture from 1 Kings, we see this very thing happening. Up to this point in scripture, we see God speaking to Moses in a burning bush. We see God speaking to Balm through a talking donkey. And while some of these instances would be surprises today, they're dramatic, clear interventions from God. They were common in the lives of biblical characters. God communicated with God's people in ways that they couldn't ignore. And so Elijah comes to the mouth of this cave, depressed, seemingly having given up on hope. And in the midst of that, a storm comes. What a perfect opportunity to hear an answer from God. When life is chaotic and stressful and busy, that's when we're most desperate to hear from God, at least. But in this moment, God was not in the wind, was not in the earthquake, was not in the fire. Despite God traditionally showing up in the dramatic, the ecstatic, the overwhelming, God is in the gentle whisper. And Elijah recognizes this voice at once. I think that many of us would be surprised to hear God in the gentle whisper today. And not because we don't believe that God communicates with us in quietness, 
but because it would mean that we had a moment of quiet to be able to hear that voice. The practice of meditation allows us moments of this stillness that we so often crave. It's a practice that we see Jesus exemplify often through his ministry. The gospel according to Mark that Pastor Angela read, Jesus goes to a deserted place alone while it's still dark. I can imagine he wasn't even distracted by the morning calls of birds and animals who are welcoming a new day. That sort of quietness is unheard of today. To start, it's the constant demands of life. If we aren't producing new work or new personal bests, if we're not starting new hobbies, then we are somehow failing at life. So that's the first, and then there's the stress. Maybe the stress of something cherished in our life that's changing, or maybe our friends or our children are struggling or we haven't reached that goal yet, even though we've been working so hard at it. On top of all of that is the physical noise. I can't ride in my car or do dishes without music or a podcast playing, and I don't often sit on the couch without scrolling on Instagram. Yes, it would be shocking to hear God in the quiet, because when is it ever quiet? Some of us wouldn't even know where to begin. How do you start practice of meditation? And so here is some place to get you started. This is in the book that we will be reading as a congregation called Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. One of, maybe one of these will be something that you can be intentional about this Lent. He offers four different practices of meditation. The first is meditating on scripture. Notice the word meditating on instead of just reading. The difference is subtle, but meditating on scripture is slow. Maybe it means you read the same passage over for days at a time. And while you read it slowly, you may be able to picture the lives of the characters. You may even be able to see yourself as an active participant in the story rather than a passive observer. You can use tools such as Lectio Divina or Sacred Imagination, ancient practices that any of the pastors would, would love to help you with if they're new to you. The second way that he suggests we can meditate is what we might often think of when we hear meditation. This is stillness and silence. Do you have a quiet room you can escape to before the kids wake up or before the news is turned on? Perhaps if a room's not available, a no pair of noise-canceling headphones will do the trick. Find a comfortable position and sit in a posture that makes it easy to give things up to God or receive wisdom from God. The third is recognizing God's glory through creation. Go outside and see the power of the mountains or the intricate designs in the flower petals. Breathe in the sweet smells and take in the soft chirps of the birds. Allow yourself to be in awe of who God is and what God has created in this beautiful world. The fourth way to meditate that he outlines is to meditate on our times. He says to have a Bible in one hand and newspaper in another without allowing ourselves to be controlled by the political cliches and the propaganda. Instead, when we meditate on our time, we ask for wisdom and we ask for guidance. I encourage you to read more about these suggestions or reach out to a pastor for guidance because stepping back from the chaotic of days of our lives even in moments, it allows us to create a space for God to dwell. We can pick one or two of these practices to engage with this season, but meditation doesn't always mean that it's gonna be possible to hear God in the simple ways that Elijah does. 
Let me give you an example. About six months ago, I found a yoga class at my gym titled Surrender. Now, if you don't know much about yoga, there are generally two types of yoga classes. There's the kind where you're in constant motion or you're holding warrior pose until your muscles are quivering and you really can't wait until the end, the shavasana, which is basically just a two-minute nap. The second type of, sur of yoga class, which is what this surrender class is, it actually sometimes feels like a 60-minute nap. The lights are low, the instructor speaks in soft tones about mindfulness, there's a focus on clearing the mind. So after the first class that I attended, it instantly became part of my Friday routine. A break and a reset that I looked forward to. So, one Friday a few months ago, I was busy and stressed, making final preparations for the youth lock-in that evening, I contemplated not going, but I convinced myself that of all days, this is probably the best day to go. I drove to the gym, set up the mat, and the lights dimmed. I closed my eyes to take in the beauty of silence, but instead of silence, I heard my own thoughts swarming. Did all the, the, the leaders have the information that they needed? Uh, what items do I still have to pick up from the store? How much time do I need to finish setting up? Will the escape room be the way I hope it will? Will the group even have fun? I should probably eat something before a night of candy and soda. On and on my head whirred. And so I kept waiting for the calm to rush over me, but 60 minutes passed and I was feeling more anxious than I did when I entered. And that experience taught me something very important about meditation. We can't expect to carve out 15 or even 60 minutes of our day to be fully still and to hear God's gentle whisper if the rest of our lives aren't following a similar pattern. Meditation is a practice that starts in our daily lives. The idea of holy leisure is one that encourages us to live a balanced life, to pace ourselves, to take our time to enjoy beauty because that is what we were created for above all else, to live in the presence of God, to revel in that relationship. And we, we have created this world for us where busyness and stress and production are actually celebrated. We run from event to event, expecting near perfection from every single thing that we do, and it is exhausting. Elijah experiences this too. He was feeling beat down by life, and we see in the scripture today that he was overwhelmed and tired, and he temporarily lost perspective of who God is and what God is doing in the world. It took Elijah 40 days in solitude for him to be ready to hear God's gentle whisper. He recognizes God's voice when he heard it, and he heard, what are you doing here, Elijah? It seems so silly to me that God asks us these types of questions. God knows what we're here for. God knows what we're going to say. And so I think that God asks us these questions so that we can decipher the answer for ourselves. What are we here for, truly? When God asks us in our lives and in our quiet meditation, how will we answer? Friends, Christian meditation is not just a practice of emptying the mind or simply seeking peace in the midst of like life's pressures like it is in Eastern practices and secular practices, much like the yoga class I described to you. Christian meditation is a practice that redirects our lives so that we can deal with human life, sometimes by hearing the call to do the difficult thing. In order for that to take place, we must also recognize that it is a practice that fully embraces God's grace in our everyday lives. What are we here for? Well, I'll tell you, it isn't what society has convinced us we're here for. 
We were not created for the chaotic. We weren't created to be objects of production. We weren't created to worship fleeting, fleshy desires. We were created to be in full communion with God all the time, to rest with God, to enjoy God, to enjoy one another. And that's not something that we have to earn. We don't have to earn a time of rest or meditation because that's what grace is. That's not how God's incredible love works. And so I encourage you this Lent to practice meditation both in intentional moments with scripture or with silence, but also in your life by redefining what gives you worth. Both together may bring a deep richness in your life that can truly only come from God. And maybe you'll hear God in an unexpected way. And so in a spirit of meditation, I invite you all to close your eyes. I invite you to breathe deeply and quiet yourself. Center yourself to God's presence here in this place and listen for God's word to you this day. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, keeper of our days, help us to meditate on your word day and night. Help us to meditate on that sacrifice of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, on the cross and in the power of his resurrection. 
Let us meditate on your goodness, on all the many blessings you have bestowed upon us. And let us meditate on how our gifts of time, talent, and treasure may bear witness to your love in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. God desires to be in a relationship with us in every moment of our lives and beyond. And this meal that we have before us, it's an opportunity for us to be fed and nourished, to taste and to see that our God is present with us. And the table is now ready. It's the table of company with Jesus and all who love him. So come to the table, you who have much faith and you who would like to have more. Come to the table, you who have been here often and you who haven't been in a while. Come to the table, you who have tried to follow Jesus and you who have failed. For it's Jesus who invites us to meet him here. As we enter into a time of prayer, I'd like to remind you that we are a Stephen Ministry congregation. And if you have any personal and confidential prayer requests, there will be a Stephen Minister to pray with you in the Melrose Chapel immediately following the service, which is to my right and to your left. I'd like to also remind you that we have flowers in the back. If you know anyone who needs some cheering up, please take one with you on your way out, courtesy of our wonderful deacons. A note of pastoral concern, 
Donald All, the father of Kirk member Tiffany All, passed away at 99 years old on February 22nd. Our condolences to the entire family. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O God, our Creator and Redeemer. In your wisdom, you made all things and sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image to love and to serve you. When we were slaves in Egypt, you freed us and led us through the waters of the sea. You fed us with heavenly food in the wilderness and satisfied our thirst from desert springs. On a holy mountain, you gave us your law to guide us in your way. Through the waters of the Jordan, you led us into the land of your promise, and you sustained us in times of trial. You spoke through prophets, calling us to turn from our willful ways to new obedience and righteousness. You sent your one only Son to be the way to eternal life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. the night of Jesus' arrest, he gathered in the upper room with his disciples, and he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which has been broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take, drink. This is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you and for forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, whenever you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the saving death of our Lord Jesus Christ until the day of his final return. These are the gift of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, as you fed your people in the wilderness with unexpected food, so you feed us at this table with a simple loaf and cup. Here you transform us by the working of your wondrous love. Now send us out to be Christ's body in your broken and beautiful world to bear your good news of hope and joy for all. Amen. be seated. Friends, this Lent season, I encourage you to look inward so that you may be changed outwardly by the love and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as you do, may you love God so much that you love nothing too much. And may you fear God enough that you fear nothing at all. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen.